Some of the most remarkable people in this world don't appear on movie screens or in sports arenas. They work in offices, study in classrooms, and raise families at home. They're just ordinary people like you and I. Ordinary people who happen to have experienced something extraordinary and survived. Off the Map is a travel television series I directed and shot over a 12-year period. Unlike most explorer stories, these modern travelers are women. Ordinary women who agreed to be filmed taking journeys to extraordinary places. On my Ecuador program, I was joined by my female host, Kathy. Our intention was to fly from Ecuador's capital, Quito, to a very remote Shuar Indian village. As we flew out over the rainforest, I had two main impressions that were very strong. One was that it was vast, vast forest without any roads whatsoever or with very few signs of human habitation. And then once in a while, there would be a village in the middle of nowhere. Kathy's first impression was quite accurate. We really didn't know exactly where we were headed. All we knew was that a Shuar village had invited us to witness and document some of their ecotourism activities. They wanted to open up their village to tourism, and um, we would provide them with uh, publicity. This trip simply was going to be beyond our complete control. As we landed at the airstrip, we were coming into the unknown to a certain extent because despite my guide Miguel's best efforts, he hadn't been able to convince the pilot to actually bring us to Canis, the, the, the village that we were going to. We were at a village called Kangaimi. I didn't know how many kilometers away or how long it was going to be. All I knew was I was going to have to walk, and that wasn't what was expected. On top of this, we had six large bags of video equipment. Thankfully, the villagers from Canas agreed to carry the bags. My guide, Miguel, was a member of the Shuar Indian tribe, an indigenous group that live in the rainforest of the upper Amazon basin. Lucky for me, I didn't actually know how far it was going to be. They told me that it might take me six hours, but it turned out to be nine and a half hours of the most difficult walking I've ever done. It was up and down, very steep, very slippery rainforest footpaths that were muddy and rocky. All I really remember about the Shuar people was that in the 19th century, they became famous for their elaborate process of shrinking heads. They sought the soul of the victim, which was contained in and by the shrunken head. The control of the soul would enable them to control their wives and daughters' labor. I was very glad to see Miguel's family when we finally made it to the community of Canis. In the early 20th century, Europeans began trading manufactured goods, including shotguns, asking in return for shrunken heads. The result was an increase in local warfare, including head hunting, that has contributed to the perception of the Shuar as violent. Canis is a community that, by North American standards, is very isolated. There were no roads, no vehicles of any kind coming in there, and the only communication they had with the outside world was a two-way radio that was powered by a car battery that was hooked up to a solar panel. So I took advantage of this means of communication to try to find out if I could get picked up by an airplane at that community because as much as I enjoyed the adventure of hiking in, I really didn't want to do it again. So I was assured by a contact in the capital city that they'd be able to send a plane right into the airstrip at Canis for me. Little did I know how things would really work out later on. Muchas gracias, Eduardo. Hasta luego. As we sat around the fire, I was asking questions about the, the houses, because the construction was, was fascinating to me. It was beautiful. The houses were made of very small poles, and they looked like they could be quite frail. But at the same time, you could see they were very well built. And Miguel explained to me that they withstand earthquakes very well, because in this area, we're not far from the, the foothills of the Andes, and there's often earthquakes, but the houses, uh, if they're well built, don't fall down. 
despite the hard bed that I ended up sleeping on all week, it was actually very beautiful waking up in the morning because the spaces between the walls of my house let me look straight out into the forest and seeing the trees outlined by the sun and, and getting brighter as I lay there not wanting to get up. When I did get up, it was also always very pleasant and peaceful to go to the river just below the hut that I was staying in and wash myself there. And this is where everyone in the village bathed all the time. And it was just such a quiet, peaceful spot. You couldn't be in a hurry the way we are at home in our usual lives when we're going to work and that sort of thing. Sitting on a rock at the edge of a beautiful river is really hard to feel in a rush. Miguel and his cousin Olga invited me to go swimming and the river was beautiful so we swam up river a little bit and we're just sitting relaxing enjoying the sun and the noise of the river and I was amazed when Miguel just waded out and started rolling the rocks around in the river and started pulling up these fish with his hands and throwing them over to us on the beach. ended up being our dinner later on that day. They were quite tasty. The next day, Miguel's brother Santiago took me on a hike through the rainforest. I can understand why they call it the rainforest. There are streams running everywhere and condensation falling from the trees. One of the most remarkable parts of the experience for me of being in Canis was how I was welcomed into the community and welcomed into the people's lives and it was very much a community effort. Each day there were different activities and different brothers or cousins acted as guides into the forest or on a, on a hike or on a river trip and no matter where we went and how far we hiked some of the women from the village were always there ahead of us with their cooking pots and make a fire and prepare a wonderful lunch for us. Everybody was very much involved in my visit. I was in the rainforest, and sure enough, it rained about half the time that I was there. And when it rained, it rained quite hard, and the people in Canis didn't seem to feel very active, a lot like us at home on a rainy day.
but there was always something happening. People sitting around and visiting, or a lot of baskets got made on the rainy days. Not to mention alternative uses for my video equipment. Traditionally, the Shuar people painted their faces with vegetable dyes for special occasions. So I was invited to, to have this done for me, which was, was quite special. Each person has their own individual design, so every time they do it, each person has their own, it's almost like a signature. And the men have certain geometrical designs with lines, and the designs for women have more dots and more rounded shapes. Fortunately, or maybe unfortunately, it, it uh, washed off the same day. It's becoming more and more well known that the rainforest all over the world is full of plants that are very useful to humans for a number of reasons. Where I was visiting in Canis, of course we were surrounded by fascinating medicinal plants. And my guide Santiago spent an afternoon giving me a tour of some of the more important plants that his people use. Santiago showed me a plant that was like wild ginger and I was amazed by how many different uses it had including for women who are pregnant, it was used to, in a certain recipe, to calm some of the stomach or abdominal pain. It's ginger. It was also used in a different recipe by people to, to cure their dogs when they had uh, a wound or something wrong with their skin. I saw the dragon's blood tree. When it's cut, it bleeds sap that looks exactly like blood. And Santiago explained to me that if a person drinks too much of the sap, it can be very dangerous and could even kill you, but used properly, it cures a multitude of ailments. For example, a woman who decides she doesn't want to have any more children can drink a small amount of this and she won't have any more children. And at the same time, it's used for curing scratches or cuts on your skin. I saw a plant that's used in case of an emergency if someone cuts themselves quite seriously with a knife or a machete or something, and by grinding up the plants and using the juice that comes out, it'll help close up the wound and stop bleeding. And Santiago explained to me that the property of this plant means that they don't need to get a cut stitched up or anything like that. It helps to close the cut up really quickly. <laughs> One morning, Marcos and his cousin Jorge took me on a raft trip down the Kushumi River, and I could see that his raft had been very recently built, and it was incredible to me because it was made entirely from poles and vines. There was no piece of metal or hardware anywhere on it.
as we went through the rapids, the water was shallow, but the current was really powerful. And it amazed me to see these two, these two strong men were fighting with all their strength to control the boat. Challenge for me, of course, was to try and keep the camera dry. But I had to have faith in them that they wouldn't accidentally let me go. Uh, other than that, it was a very peaceful, beautiful ride. While we were on our raft ride, Santiago fished for our lunch. When we arrived at our picnic spot, some of the women from the village were already there and had a fire and, and lunch all ready for us. And there were little fish like sardines and bigger fish that they had caught straight from the river that morning. And there's a real variety of different kinds of plants that are eaten as well, related to bananas and potatoes, so it was never boring what we ate, especially on this day when they presented us with giant beetle larvae. I'm pretty brave. I, I ate everything I was served that week, whatever sorts of fish or things were given to me, but I have to say I didn't quite have the heart to eat a giant insect larva. <laughs> Santiago and Andre did a demonstration for us of a traditional greeting ceremony. The history of the Shuar tribe is one of a lot of violence and warfare. As they've been modernized, they don't need to do those things anymore. But the community I stayed with was trying very hard to retain and teach people about their traditions. So part of that tradition was making sure that a visitor who showed up at your house was a friend and not an enemy. So they had a ritualized greeting ceremony where they shook their spears at each other and shouted a series of questions and answers and greetings. And once they were finished, they sat down and had a drink together. On the last night of my visit, I was invited to participate in the traditional dances. I was a little worried that I wouldn't be able to do it well enough, but it was very important for them to reassure me that it didn't matter that I had to try this out. It was a very warm welcome that I had into actually trying their dances. It took a lot more energy than I might have thought. As it turned out, all the reassurances that the plane would come and pick me up in Canis didn't come true, and at the last minute I found out that I had to make that hike back out through the rainforest. So once I got over my disappointment and was resigned to doing it, it became part of the adventure. Once I finally got to the airstrip, I was just exhausted. And I was also sad to be leaving. I hadn't been there that long, but I'd had a very warm experience and I'd really been welcomed into these people's lives. It was raining really hard and the small plane that came down was very lucky to be able to get through the clouds. 
to pick me up, and the pilot was in a huge hurry to take off again while the conditions were safe. So I ended up having to say goodbye really quickly. I felt very sad as I flew away, and I really wished I could have stayed a little bit longer. This trip to Ecuador was more strenuous than I had expected, but it was very special to get somewhere where I had to rely on my body for transportation. That certainly doesn't happen in my regular life. And so in a lot of ways this trip reminded me of what it's like to really have to rely on myself and on other people, and it was a very positive experience. It sounds like a cliché, but the fact is that you can make friends with people who live very far away under very different circumstances, and now I feel like I have friends who live in the rainforest in Ecuador, and I may or may not ever see them again. I hope I do, but I always retain that memory and that thought that there's people there that I made a connection with across great physical and cultural barriers.